when you see a figurative image, a picture, it kind of identifies someone very specifically, but it also puts you at a distance. It's a different kind of relationship. Pictures of mothers and children are ubiquitous, so I just didn't want to go down that road. And also women using themselves in their work, taking their clothes off mostly. This was the way that you became a performance artist at the time. I just wanted to avoid that because I wanted you to kind of hear the woman rather than look at her. And it made nobody happy <laughs> because the women said, okay, well, I can identify with the experience, but why do you have to have the theory? And the guys would say, oh, I like the theory, but why do you have to have that stuff in it, right? I didn't intend to upset anyone, but it was something that just seemed urgent and had to be done at the time. And I was simply reflecting the things that were around me in terms of theory, experience, and the movement. Are you wearing lip gloss and earrings? <laughs> hey, you know what? I know it's your body. Lip gloss is a video that was made over several years. I made this video of my daughter when she was five or six years old dancing around in our living room in a pink tutu, right? Just capturing the beauty of my daughter at that time. And then later, talking to my daughter, just talking about the realities of being a young woman, her thoughts about relationships and boys and the new experiences that she's having and identity that, in a sense, that existed. The sense of, of one needing to find their identity, carve out the space for themselves and to know who they are, and seeing your child grow from this little innocent, you know, cutie pie to this beautiful young woman who's trying to find her way in the world. And we had a conversation, and I happened to record myself having this conversation. So you really only hear the conversation from my point of view, but you get an idea of what this conversation is about as it's juxtaposed with this image of the innocence of a child just being and playing. But you gotta put some earrings on, put some lip gloss on, look a little, you know? We talk about ideas of gender and sex and experience and, you know, and I'm contradicting myself in this video, right? I'm, I'm saying all kinds of things like, you know, be yourself, love yourself, but then at the same time, put on some lip gloss, you know? Smile a little bit, you know, all the things that, that we say that we shouldn't do. Uh, it's, it's, I admit that there's some contradiction there, but I'm going to be brave and acknowledge it. Home Depot is a video that was created as part of an installation at AWOL in 2016. And I use footage, again, footage of myself that was made many years ago when I was in my 30s looking into a mirror, caressing myself, my skin, accepting and appreciating my body, who I was, who I am. And that video footage sat as a digital file in my computer for a very long time. And in 2016, I had an experience where I went to Home Depot, and as I was walking in, this younger guy was walking out and looked at me and our eyes locked, and I thought, hmm, well, you know, this hasn't happened uh, in a while. You know, what's going on, you know? He said I was beautiful. And this man overheard and called me a tall drink of water. And so as I'm walking around Home Depot, this is a real experience, I'm thinking of all the ways men have referred to my body as something to play with or consume. But then I'm also thinking about, wow, Home Depot is a great place to meet men because there are tons of men, all kinds of men at Home Depot, you know? And so by the time I get home, I think of six ways in which men have thought about my body or women's bodies in general as things to play with or consume. And so in this video, I've slowed it down. It's a really slow video of me slowly caressing my face and my neck. And then there's no audio, but there's text that's overlaid that identifies these six 
ways in which men have identified my body. It also is in a space where there are six pillars. On each of the pillars, these objects exist. So the first is a tall drink of water. So I have this tall glass cylinder filled with water. The second is grass. I have melons. I have prunes. And then I have two stockings that are filled with rocks that are hanging, barely touching the pedestal. And actually they're a little, one's longer than the other. Within that space, I also had a pillar on the other side of the gallery with a book that all attendees could come and write, attendees could write their own uh, stories or narrative about their relationship with their body. And it was really, really beautiful just to read through and to read what people, the truth they told about themselves. Mm -hmm. To be an artist is to allow yourself the freedom to express yourself in any form that it manifests in the real world. I've been making art since I was a child, but I did not call myself an artist. I didn't know that that's what I was. You eventually get to this point where you're free to tell your story. I'm a visual artist and my work is informed by my personal experiences, memory, and my relationships. Thinking about the ways I think about myself and move in the world as a single mother, as a woman who's in her 40s, as well as the intergenerational relationships regarding the matrilineal line of my family. Thinking about the relationships between my mother and my grandmother, my grandmother, my sister, my grandmother was it might sound contradictory, a wonderful woman, but at the same time, she was very abusive to my sister. My relationship with my sister, all of these relationships have informed my work. There's a body of work that I created a few years ago entitled Tumors, Terrifying Unfortunate Memories of Rage and Sadness. And they were sculptures made with chicken wire and plaster and synthetic hair. I started using th synthetic hair with that work. And that work is informed by my relationship with my sister, but really about my sister and her mental illness. I gave my sister a cell phone so she could give us a call to let us know she needed help, but instead she started calling me and leaving very dysfunctional, horrific messages with claims that I had inflicted certain pains on her which were not accurate. And so I made these tumors to manifest the, the, the sickness that existed in my sister, but also it was a way for me to exercise that pain out of my body so they didn't literally manifest in tumors. The current work that I'm making are large abstract paintings that are informed by geometric abstraction and psychological energy. And they're also informed about me thinking about my life and my thoughts about being a woman in her 40s, walking in the world and how men respond to me now, and being on some level invisible. How my status changes based on the experiences in my life. So my daughter who's in her 20s is leaving for college. And where does that put me now? And I've been kind of grappling those thoughts about being an empty nester for a while. And my relationship with my mother, who is aging, who lives out of state. So I'm thinking about these things and the geometric and organic shapes in these work become placements for my body, but also they are symbols. Three-sided geometric shapes may be me thinking about my role as a mother, a role model, and also being a sexual being and how do I navigate in the space with all those things. Being a black woman in Los Angeles, I have memories of being a child walking on the street and you'll see a braid or a weft of hair on the street. And you're, you're always wondering like, where did this come from? How did this find itself on the street and off a woman's head? So the aura portraits are portraits of women that I encounter during my daily travels. And I photograph them, never their face, but always their hair, at times their body, and then the colors that they're using in their hairstyles, I then use those colors to make abstract paintings that represent those women. They are not literal portraits, realistic portraits, but they are portraits of women's aura. I've just been thinking about hair and women in my community for some time. And these works are a celebration of women, an acknowledgement of women. 
I wanted to create a portrait that represented the energy and passion of the woman. Black women, we use synthetic hair to create our hairstyles. And so this synthetic hair has a story as well, right? It's on the woman's body, it carries energy, right? And it becomes a representation of her style. But they're told that they're ghetto. But on the west side, if you see a Caucasian girl or woman wearing brightly colored hair, she's seen as being stylish or creative, expressing herself creatively. And so I always thought about this double standard. It was 1968. So everything was changing at that point. And my interest in conceptualism was then tempered with the beginnings of the women's movement and my real desire to kind of understand why it was in conceptual art that our interrogation of the subject was missing. From there I began some of the works that I'm now known for, like the post postpartum document. For mainstream conceptualists, say Art and Language or, or Kasuth, uh, they were interested in the interrogation of the object first, and then the interrogation of the interrogation itself. So I said, if you're going to do that, then interrogating the interrogation would mean examining the formation of subjectivity. And that, of course, would also involve you in the kind of questions of not exactly gender, but difference. If you're thinking of a linguistic system, as we were at that time, which is based on binary opposites, you could say that there are the kind of psychical parallels, which are like masculinity and femininity are just positions. So I wanted to try to examine this. We can both be looking at the exact same thing and have totally different perspectives about what it's about. The FBI building in Washington, D.C. is literally a building hovering over another building. And so that, to me, is sort of the architecture telling you what it's going to do. It's about my perspective, right? That's my idea. That's my perspective. And I wanted to play with that. For example, the latest work that I did was called Context Versus Perspective. I wanted it to be specific towards our relationship to government architecture. And so I invited the public to add their perspective lines. And they could actually add a, like literally say, okay, this architecture is actually going to terminate over here. Or they could add their personal perspective and say, I think this should go all the way up to here. I had blue string and thumbtacks and viewers could come and say start the line here and end it over here. What happened was we began to weave a web of community perspectives and the rules were simple. You could add, you could put tension, you could lift up, you could push down, but you could not remove somebody else's perspective. And it got really interesting in a sociology kind of way because I would say, your line is putting tension on somebody else's line. Are you okay with that? They had to think about what that meant. Like, I'm actually pushing, you know, and one person said, I'm okay with lifting up, but I'm not okay with pushing down. Architecture is a universal conversation. It is a beautiful thing because it is both sculpture and practical. It's a sculptural mass which we use in a utilitarian way. And I really like that kind of sloppiness of ideas. That gets interesting to me. I like when ideas are complicated and, and you can look at them from many different angles. Well, after I did Postpartum Document, the, the question that came up was, well, what about the time after you have children? If society is defining this ideal moment as a maternal relation, then you'd have to say being a woman is just a brief moment in your life. The kind of question that comes that's sort of movement-based, you know, it's on people's mind. 
At the time, they were thinking about questions of the body, empower women's relation to money, empower those sorts of things. So they became central for me in thinking about the themes of interim. And the best known of those works is the piece that's called Corpus, that's about the body, that uses first-person indicative stories that are kind of like blogs now, but they were reminiscent of women's magazines. But it would be very much for, for women, or for men who put themselves in the position of, of the woman, of moving from the image to listening to the story, of seeing yourself reflected in the, in the glass, recognizing the narcissism, and laughing. So because having the ability to laugh in the work was important for, for women to be released somehow from the tyranny, right, of, you know, their image in the media. Because you have to remember this was the 80s, 1980 to 84, and that, that was the big kind of question at the time. I'm interested in what I can learn and know and do with my body through durational acts and in what I call somatic epistemology, the things that we know and learn through our body that we can't know any other way. You feel and learn different things if someone holds you tightly for five minutes and you synchronize each other's heartbeats. That's a different kind of knowledge than book learning, right? I've done pieces that are up to 27, 28 hours at a time. I have a piece called Body of Knowledge where I tried to recite everything that I know until my mind or my body collapses. I see the body as a tool for exploring a political stance, a sexual stance, a gender and gender performance. In 20, 13. I participated in an exhibition by Bettina Hubby called Thanks for the Memories, and it was an exhibition to raise funds for breast cancer awareness. And I agreed to go topless to this opening of her exhibition in support um, because I also don't think that the body should be stigmatized. Several people took pictures of me and three friends who were also going topless at this opening, and they all got posted on Instagram. By the next morning, Instagram had censored those images, and I was naively shocked. I had no idea that at the time, Instagram had an explicit community guideline against female nipples. It said it. Like, female nipples, not acceptable. That blew my mind, not in a good way. <laughs> because I thought, well, first of all, how does Instagram know what my gender is? <laughs> and secondly, what is it about a female nipple that's more offensive than a male nipple? I read the guidelines over and over, and it really, it just said female nipples. It didn't say anything about male nipples. And so I Googled um, human male nipple on Wikipedia. And so I cropped that out in a circle and I slapped it on top of one of the pictures of me and the other folks and I reposted it. I was like, here you go, Instagram. And they all stayed up. And I thought that was weird. Then I got really excited to kind of play with this and explore the parameters of these content guidelines, these community guidelines that were allegedly there to keep us safe, keep us safe from the offending female nipples. And I started putting these male nipples on all kinds of images. And so I made a, a, a template for this. I just, you know, kind of cut it out, made a digital pasty. So the digital male nipple pasty went viral a year after I posted it because a couple celebrities somehow got a hold of it and kind of amplified it on social media. And, and there was one week in 2015 where I think it was shared 20 million times. <laughs> and the, you don't really plan to be a viral sensation. Like, no, you know, you know, I don't, maybe some people do. I don't, I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know what that meant. I get really nervous when companies dictate what parts of our bodies are open okay and what they mean. I want to be able to tell you what my body means at any given moment. That should be my right. To me, that's bodily autonomy. I want to be able to say, today I identify as male, today I identify as female, today I'm gender non-conforming. I want to say, today my body is sexy, today my body is not sexy. And I don't want social media to tell me that 
based on how much of my areolas are showing. Just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Very quickly you get to the question of masculinity. And what is it that, you know, constructs femininity and masculinity and is it exchangeable among men and women, which we would certainly agree to that fluidity now, but that's an argument that had to be made then. And what I had noticed around me was a growing kind of concern by women to fit themselves into this mold of the masculine ideal, you know, to break the glass ceiling. The, the real wake-up call was seeing that women in the military were asking for the right to go to the front and kill. And so <clears throat> I had to say, well, where has that feminist ideology taken us? At that time, uh, around 1990, as you remember, the beginnings of the first Gulf War, there was this sort of production of pathological masculinity in the media. And people brought out their, you know, their ribbons, their flags. Their, there was a conflation of national identity and masculinity and all the new war technology the flashy spectacle. Before they could even invent a narrative for it, we were just like watching things explode. What I wanted to show in the Gloria Patri work was something of that spectacle and to, of course, satirically present it with the way that I uh, juxtapose the different military logos and the trophies with their sayings, you know, like, cut it off and kill it. Against that backdrop, what I did is to write some stories. This is my kind of trans moment when I tried to write like a man. And I wrote the stories about fishing, baseball, watching a woman have, have a child, these sorts of things where the character in the story, which is it's in third person, starts out thinking he's in control. And the end of the story just ends up with a kind of total loss of it. And then the one last story in the group of shields in Gloria Patri does a reverse. It's a woman on an exercise machine feeling out of control and putting herself in, in this kind of mold of, of achieving something or dominating the machine and dominating her, you know, her body. For me, it captured something of the contemporary situation where women are trying to cast themselves <laughs> in that ideal, but then that ideal itself was never really working. Red and Boiling uses shadow puppetry, drag, and comedy to tell verbatim stories of queer women and non-binary individuals from around the world. We wanted to tell these stories from these interviews that I collected. I continue to interview women and queer people all the time for this show. It's a constantly evolving piece. We are sharing those stories using the visual format of shadow puppetry, also through drag, which is more of a interactive medium. I always never really connected with the masculine energy. I felt like I was somewhere in between. I was able to start experimenting with drag. Drag became this, this way of communicating with people that also was a way of exploring myself. When we see someone who we can't place their gender, oftentimes the impulse is to clarify. And what I would love to encourage people is, how can you witness me in drag, witness me in something that you can't fully place and be okay with that. There are oftentimes experiences that we feel that we think we're the only ones going through them. When I was in the interview process, I discovered there were so many experiences that I thought only I went through. I thought, oh, this must be my personal anxiety, my personal fear. Through this process of interviewing people, we discovered there was so much that she and even I like share in terms of experiences of, of the complexities of being queer and out for many years and, and how that develops and changes and shifts based off of the people you meet or, or daily situations like 
getting an apartment or going to the doctor and how those simple things that everyone does, how it, it kind of becomes so different when you have this extra layer of identity that can sometimes make it more complicated. Oh my God, you know, half of the women that I interviewed said they have, they go through this exact same experience, this exact feeling. And it made me realize, wow, there are these experiences that we go through as a community, but we're not talking about them because we don't really necessarily have the platform to. I wanted to create a show that I craved as an audience member, something that reflected my reality, something that was nuanced, that was complex, that was intelligent, that wasn't a sob story. And, and that where I wasn't the punchline either. The way that I approach my work in a political process is also how do I engage the community that I'm talking about in my process itself. I want to create a show where if I'm interviewing people for my show, that they come and they feel that the work was made for them and not using them to educate others. We inserted in our programs, we have a pamphlet that has information about different organizations led by queer women. Because if you want to see this show, maybe you're going to want to support a business that is owned by a queer woman. How can we constantly keep that audience engagement, that community engagement? It's not just about the show. It's not just about the performance. It's how do we leave that trail to really change the world and change society and change representation and, and, and bring equality through the work and not just for the moment of the hour and a half that they come to see the show. So in, in my most recent work, I was interested in kind of looking at the, the history of feminism and thinking about a generational relation to, to younger women. I think that my work in general, you could think of it like um, zooming out <laughs> rather than in and, and putting the personal, which I have always been concerned with as being political, in the, in the context which it gives you more historical grounding. A lot of art history is filled with photographs of men with women, and it says something like, Man Ray with woman. And who is she? Does she have a name? Like, I bet she's an artist too. One thing that was important to me was to give credit where credit's due. Now Be Here was a really exciting idea because Kim was thinking about trying to account for all of the women artists in Los Angeles who had been historically and systematically omitted from the history books, from the exhibitions, from conversations, from record keeping. Now Be Here is a project that seeks to gather and photo on a large scale and mass female and female identifying artists in their respective cities. How many female identifying artists are in LA and can we show the world so that maybe they can see that there's a larger pool to choose from when organizing these exhibitions. It was simultaneously really exciting and very daunting because how do you account for all the voices that have been missing. How do you find them? How do you get them to come? And then I have these skills just because of who I am. I'm really good at organizing things. I'm a very organized person and I do think very methodically. And so organizing large scale project like that for me is a very comfortable experience. I'm more of the sort of architect, right? I'm more of the, the mastermind behind the whole thing. I'm good at sort of order of operations. What needs to come first? What needs to come second? And so I could visualize and organize, how do you invite 900 people to show up on one day and not be confused? You have to do a lot of prep work, showing the world a visual display of like, here, there are 900 female identifying artists in LA and you've shown five. I think the model of Now Be Here is itself a form of protest because it resists the monolithic object-making male master who creates a valuable commodity. Completely resists it. The, the art, the thing that is now be here is the experience. It's not just the photo. The photo is a document of the thing. And the thing is the experience of being together and of seeing each other. 
of recognizing how many other women and female identified artists there are in your community. When we were gathered for the Now Be Here in Los Angeles, there was so much joy in the space. Everyone was looking at each other with this like really, like this energy in their eyes, like it was a family reunion, but it was also a birthday party. It was just this collective celebration, but to be seen, there is something so radical in being seen. Standing in that courtyard with almost a thousand other women of all ages and all backgrounds and all artistic styles was, it was really one of the most empowering experiences I've ever had. I mean, it was just like, I, we were all crying. And, and it was like, the energy was palpable. You could, the emotional energy, the excited energy, the artistic energy, the historic energy. It was, you knew it was a meaningful moment. And I was so grateful to be a part of that. I was also topless and now be here. I really appreciate the model that Now Be Here gave to us. It is an inspiration and encouragement to other artists to think of ways that they might be able to do projects like that and support their community of um, female artists and um, gender nonconforming artists and the artists that are not seen and supported and heard. Because I think we all, as artists, we speak out, we make statements, and every statement we make is an opportunity to also kind of to include other voices and, um, and to collaborate. And the beautiful thing about what happened that day was that artists were inspired and became more confident about using their voices. And so then conversations started happening and splinter groups started happening. I'm an artist and I'm also a member of the community. Not only are we all here, but everybody has a number and you can match a name to a number. So the website for the project shows the photo of all the numbers and then underneath is a basically a searchable list with all of their names and all of their numbers. The next phase of the website is for me to hot link the names to their websites and to also list primary medium because my goal is to create a very useful database for the world and for curators to be able to find new artists that they, they haven't shown a million times. Now Be Here was a really amazing opportunity. It was great volunteering because you just met so many women and saw women that you knew. And the energy was just so beautiful, being in this space with women who are also artists and mothers and just, you know, you'd see someone like, oh my God, there's so-and-so, or someone would tell you about another artist and you're like, oh, I mean, it was just great. It was really, really great. And I will say I intentionally wore a yellow sweater so I could find myself in that picture. I'm on, if you look at it, I'm on the left side. <laughs>
our lives like Simone de Beauvoir and Sartre and have these open relationships, but it's not working. <laughs> and another letter that's sent is one from my friend who's, you see that there are two children involved. She's telling me everything is okay, and then the child is writing on it, mom just about burned the house down <laughs> type of thing. So it, it's just, you see it, it, instances of people trying to change their, the ways of living, like communal living and sharing childcare and things, demonstrating against the war, trying to figure out, you know, what their futures would be. But in, in that way, I thought of it as this kind of invocation of the practical past, the tactics of, of living, and to ask, you know, what, if anything, is passed on to this generation. The women's movement has evolved over time. That is a particular tendency within it. And, and to consider myself something like a participant observer in an ethnographical sense, so that there is a record of that. That's what I feel the contribution of my work would be. I think working with artists actually opens my mind. It, it creates a space in my mind as an activist, as an advocate, to think about things on a different level. It reminds me of the fact that I'm not just working on policy, that I am working on culture change, that I am working on awareness raising, that I am trying to lift up ideas and concepts that we're not always thinking about. I think sometimes as an advocate, a professional advocate, I can get bogged down in what is this policy, how is it going to get passed through the legislature, et cetera. When I work with artists, I have the opportunity to go beyond that bubble. In 2016, we were part of a coalition together that met here to get rid of the rape statute of limitations, which did happen, which was extremely exciting. And I actually met Lily as part of the coalition, not as an artist, as an activist. Maya Paley and the National Council of Jewish Women represent the unsung heroes, the important people who are actually making change, who are shifting culture without necessarily any nod, you know, any thanks or applause. They do the work quietly, but they get it done. When I was contemplating whether or not to come public about Bill Cosby's sexual violence upon me, I told them the only way that I would come public is if my speaking out would actually help to impact change on a societal level. Maybe it could help change laws. We started lobbying, campaigning. We, we took uh, caravans. We drove up to the state capitol. We were able to, in six months, abolish the statute of limitations on rape prosecution in California through six hearings that resulted in unanimous votes. We did use performance art for that. So the National Council for Jewish Women and Maya they hosted our meetings. We met here. And Maya solicited the help of the youth with whom she works to come with us and do rallies. We did rallies in front of Bill Cosby's star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. I brought my Afro-Cuban you know, folklore. I put my face in these, this uh, paint, this war paint that's symbolic of the Orishas. I poured a libation over his star and we did some performance art where we ripped up the bill. When we went to the Capitol building in Sacramento, we uh, all had tape across our mouths. So we did incorporate art as a vehicle through which we were able to really effectively express you know, our rage, healthy rage, it's indignation. Our performance art during these protests, they just helped to really accent what we were trying to express in words. And you'll see us with all our gear, we all wore clocks and we wore them around our neck and we did this performance art where we were like dragging our feet because like how long is it gonna take for these uh, antiquated patriarchal laws to change and so we were in there in you know the senate hearings and the council hearings with these clocks tape over our mouth war paint on my face and that provided a really strong visual sometimes you need art to help impact change at the end of that campaign lily created this amazing sculpture this piece about the campaign and about survivors of rape and sexual violence that was one of the pieces that reminded me of how important art is in activism after really not thinking about it for a long time. And so that's why I specifically felt compelled to reach out to Lily for Row at 46. She invited me to make a community-based project. 
engaging the public to discuss issues that impact victims of sexual violence. How can we use art to express our concerns, to agitate action in the right direction against the oppressor, to also just incite conversation? The Roe v. Wade Community Art Project was created on January 23rd, 2019 at our annual Roe v. Wade commemoration event. And it was basically a way for attendees of the event to participate in a community art piece, to take what we were talking about at the event, reproductive justice and the 46th anniversary of Roe v. Wade, to express that, the meaning of that, the importance of that, as individuals and as a community through this art piece. Art is a vehicle through which people can express pain or suffering or empathy as an advocate, pain or suffering as a victim. They can express it in a sort of safe way because they don't have to use their words. They'll be held accountable for their words, but they can use their art to express what words don't suffice in expressing. So the Human Trafficking Outreach Project has been going on since the beginning of 2014. And it was completely up to the survivors who, as a group, looked through the designs together and came up with what they thought was the best design. They don't want it to be something that looks scary because they would not have approached a poster that, had, that looked or felt scary in any way. When we heard that survivors of human trafficking were not happy with what the Attorney General's office had created, we decided to create this poster contest for teens. We also decided that what was most important was that human trafficking survivors themselves could decide which poster they thought was the most appropriate for LA County to use. Trafficking is not what people imagine or what people see on TV. So when we select the poster, it was something that represent the issue. I remember one of the poster was like, hand was being tied or hand was being chained and the chain was break, you know. That's not what trafficking look like. I'm a survivor of trafficking. I was brought to this country when I was 17 years old. I was promised for a job as a nanny, salary of $150 a month. But for me at that time, it, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of money. I was in that situation for, for three years, working as a nanny and domestic servitude in, in a home in um, Beverly Hills area and I did not get paid. I was physically and verbally abused almost every single day. And I eventually wrote a letter to the neighbor next door. And luckily, the neighbor helped me escape and took me directly to the organization that I work for right now. Since then, after going through the services and healing process, I decided to give back to the community and that's when I became involved becoming one of the founding members of the leadership program which is I manage throughout this year. Since we started this project, the calls to the local hotline, to CAST's hotline, due to poster viewings have gone up a thousand percent. That means that the work that our volunteers are doing out on the streets, going door to door, is really making a huge difference. It's providing access to help. It's providing information to victims, survivors, and witnesses of human trafficking. Trafficking has no face. If we going to design a poster for all form of trafficking, it's gonna have a lot of images. Not everyone, you know, can understand English. Even for me, when I came to this country, I, I didn't speak English. So having multiple language that is spoken in, in the community is very important. The poster that was chosen by the survivors is five or six silhouettes of profiles that are just different skin tones. And it's inclusive in that it's gender neutral. You can't tell if these silhouettes are men, women, or gender non-conforming people and it's inclusive of people of all ethnicities and racial backgrounds. And that way, we made sure to be inclusive of everyone who could be a possible victim or survivor of human trafficking. 
A study was done a few years ago showing that states and municipalities that have actually fully implemented and enforced this law have found it to be the leading reason why prosecutors have been able to find and prosecute human traffickers. That was a really big success and the reason why working with Santa Monica was such a success is because it actually became the first city in LA County to fully implement this law. I'm extremely proud of the work that we did with Santa Monica. I'm so grateful both to the city attorney's office, to Gary Rhodes, to the, the Women's Commission for working so closely with us and really making it happen. It's a huge accomplishment because there are 88 cities in Los Angeles County and Santa Monica is the first and the only one to fully comply with this law at this point. Poverty is, of course, the number one factor that people are getting into trafficking situation. You know, people want to have a better life. People want to have safety and people want to have a roof over their head. Homelessness is one of the factors of people being trafficked because if someone offering them, if you do this, I'll give you food. If you do this, I'll give you a place to live. So they have no choice but to take that offer, you know, to, to end trafficking, we have to end other issues first. Change is possible, but it's going to take everyone's efforts to make change. There is change within government, there is change within law, and we need a change in the community because community is the one who drive change. From my perspective, art gives advocates a space to express themselves and a space to raise awareness and educate the public in a different way. Artists are already out there bringing feeling, bringing meaning to so many issues, so many social justice causes. Combining that with what everyday people want, people who are not artists. I'm not an artist myself, but Connecting the two really gives me an opportunity and I, and I feel like it gives others an opportunity to, to express themselves beyond just showing up at an event or advocating for a law, to really talk about culture change, building a movement together. And art is such a big part of our culture. I think it's actually critically important to, to connect art and activism.